else in Hollywood is that they're always very beautiful and very classy. Because think about it, they win a beauty contest in some little town, then they come out to Hollywood full of ambitions and dreams. They arrive here on the bus or the plane. They kind of go through that whole uh, Playboy Mansion syndrome where a lot of people sample their charms. They get a little disillusioned. They look around and they say, why am I giving it away for free? One of the madams gets hold of them. The madam is usually a very beautiful woman in her 30s who's been through that whole scene. And she says to the girl, hey, honey, you could be making thousands of dollars a night. Why are you giving it away? You're not going to be a movie star. Come and join me. It's just the games they always play. Many heartbreaks on the way. That's just hardly what love was. Try to keep it. interesting relationship between success and sex. If he's powerful and can make you a star, you'll be between the sheets. Hollywood has sex as its crown that it wears and that it markets itself with. When you work hard and you play hard and you live life to its fullest, I guess, uh, you, you know, you can really have a lot of fun. Although I did get my comeuppance. Well, when I became famous, when I became Rob, you have to understand, I was a very naive kid. I was 20 years old. I came into Batman. I met Adam West, who immediately introduced me to the wildest sexual debauchery you could imagine. Blindfold? To the Batmobile! Within a few months, my marriage had dissolved, and Adam and I were like two hungry sharks in a world of unlimited halibut. Actually, I think Adam was more like a killer whale in a world of plankton. Too much of us, Batman. They have a right to expect it. But we're only human. All too true. We only have so much to give. I must tell you, Adam and I have really partied very heavily. We got involved with probably 10,000 women. They don't call me the boy wonder for nothing. I never, ever slept with 10,000 women and Bert at the same time. No. I think you're off the beam, Robin. There was a time in uh, a Holiday Inn in upstate New York. Actually, we had a couple of girls in one room that we were going to party with, and then waiting for us across the hall in my room were two more girls. Yes, I remember some wonderful ladies. We're going at it, really having a wild time, and uh, afterwards, I, I reminded Adam, I said, you know, we've got these other young ladies waiting for us over there, and it's really be impolite not to go over and see them. I think Master Dick may have put his finger on it. Look, Bert, he says, I'm a grown man, he says, in that deep voice of his, he says, you know, you're a kid. I mean, we got to go across this hallway, and neither of us have any clothes on. Holy headlines, we look like page one dumbbells. I want you to go across the hallway. I want you to open the door with your key. When that door is open, I'm gonna come out, close the door, run across the hallway, and we'll be with these two girls. Poor deluded child. I said, holy age discrimination. What is it, child? And he comes rushing out, he pulls his door closed, he runs over to my door, and I lock him in the hallway. I close the door. I think the only person he ever locked out of his room uh, in any kind of hotel was an irate husband. He used to upstage me. He'd stand in front of me. He'd block me. And whenever I would say, Adam, why are you doing this? You're ruining my shot. He'd say, I'm sorry, Bert. I had to do it. I said, but why? Sorry, Bert. I had to do it. Well, here I lock him in the hallway. And he says, Bert, open this door. Open it now. And I said, Sorry, Adam, I had to do it. What are you talking about? Open this door now! I think the simplest way to answer uh, any charge of upstaging from Bert Robin, the show was called, let's see, it was called uh, Batman. street side hooking to, you know, high class cool girls. I actually had a hooker show up at one of my parties once and I was actually furious at the man who brought her and I thought, 
you just better make sure she doesn't take something. And of course, these are girls who, some of this one apparently went to Yale. These women come out to Hollywood with the dream. They can't make it here. Instead of going back <clears throat> to their hometowns, they grab on and they're, they're pulled in to this disgusting uh, mire of, uh, of prostitution. Many celebrities here in Hollywood find it convenient. And the premise behind this is, and, and listen to me carefully, it, you don't pay the women for sex because as a celebrity, you can get sex anywhere. You pay the women to leave when sex is over. They like very expensive hookers because they like the fact that they're going to pay $5,000 for a night. It makes the girl special. I think if you look back in Hollywood, historically, prostitution has always had kind of a fundamental uh, inroad as to, as to our, our culture here. It's quite common in Los Angeles for celebrities to use call girls. It's very difficult for celebrities, if they don't have a current partner, to simply go out and meet people as you and I would. Hugh Grant, what a netwit he was. When you can have anyone you want, and there's pressure from women to take them, it's such a relief to just pay for it and have it done with. The idiot probably got a heat on, probably had a few too many, and goes out on Sunset Boulevard I mean, any nitwit knows not to do that. Maybe the danger was part of it. Certainly he could afford a call girl. You can practically get them in the yellow pages here in Hollywood. Maybe he really wanted to get down and dirty. I would think that's it. Hugh Grant is a major movie star. If he'd wanted female sexual company, could have picked up the telephone or called friends and had a woman rounded at his room in one hour. She would have been beautiful and available and he probably wouldn't even have had to pay. Somebody else might have paid for it. Clearly, when Hugh Grant went out that night and picked up Divine Brown, he was looking for something else, a kind of sexual lowlife, if you wish, a sense of adventure. Uh, he wanted the, the feeling of daring, curb crawling with a baseball cap pulled down over his head. He was looking for some psychosexual adventure. In a way, I kind of like him for slumming, you know? I mean, I think it's almost kind of sweet. <laughs> it's like food. Sometimes you want a gourmet meal, sometimes you want a hamburger. I guess he was in the mood for a hot dog. The night I met Hugh Grant, I can't remember really. <laughs> yeah. It was just a normal night. It was actually a normal night. Good people make mistakes. Good people ma do dumb things. You know, I can attest to that. He told me what he wanted, but he didn't have enough for what he wanted. So I told him, this is what you're going to get. So he gets a blowjob. I mean, what man doesn't? He wanted me. Totally, all of me, from my toenails to my fingernails. Hugh Grant, who was a second-rate movie star, pulled his pants down in the car and became a giant star. And the, the, the girl that was with him in the car, Divine Brown, we all, is a household name now. Six hours later, you know, they were, they had my face all over the news. From then on, every, every itty bit of whatever they could, I was, my name came up, and I'm like, oh, God, what did I do to this guy? You know, I used a condom. I was thinking all kind of things, you know. I, I, it really scared me, though. When the Divine Brown story happened, the whole of the L.A. press corps was mobilized looking to find Divine Brown. It was probably about 48 hours after the news broke, and uh, we had heard that the London press had put up posters all over Hollywood Boulevard and Sunset Strip where uh, she and Hugh had done their naughty deed. And, um, they had offered $100,000 for, uh, for a story, I believe it was News of the World. We put something like 20 men on the ground, journalists, former policemen, detectives, and their one brief was, find this family. They found the family who had already been approached. We simply said to them, we will send a limousine to pick you up. If the limousine comes, get in the limousine. Take us on trust. At the airport will be a Learjet, which we have hired, with a red carpet and champagne on ice. If that is there, get into the Learjet. So they did all these things, and we flew them down to a secret destination in the desert. We met them there, took Divine to a hotel, and uh, did the interview while all our unfortunate colleagues were still searching L.A. and Oakland. Divine Brown suddenly became uh, one of those 15-minute celebrities that Andy Warhol talked about. And good for Divine Brown, this poor old hooker on the street, hopping into her cars, her wearing knee pads. That's not an easy life. Ms. Divine Brown has made a career out of this, as anybody, you know, who was smart and who was an opportunist 
would. Any woman who can make a full career, a full profitable and healthy career out of a single blow job, um, you know, gets my respect right down the, you know, something out of nothing. Uh, it's a wonderful thing. It's America. My new movie, it is a porno. It's, it's um, Sunset and Divine British Experience. It's like a reenactment of what happened that night with me and Hugh Grant. Man, she's cute. And it's a really good movie. It's really, it's, it has a taste of, I've seen other pornos, but you know, this one, it seems different. Not because I'm in it, but it's, it's, it seems very different. Like a unique video. It's, it's better for some reason. Like they put more effort in it than at other porno movies. Hi, how's it going? <laughs> Pretty good. What is a good looking guy like you doing on Sunset looking for a hooker? Well, I'm here for four weddings and a funeral, actually, but we don't talk about that. Yeah, he favors Hugh Grant. Yeah, but, you know, not all the way, but he favors Hugh Grant. Where are you from? England. Oh, English boy. What are you doing here? Oh, here for a little publicity work. Oh, yeah? Mm -hmm. What kind of work do you do? I'm an actor. Hugh is somebody that I've definitely looked up to as an actor. He's extremely talented. Hugh, if you're watching this, don't do anything that I wouldn't do. <laughs> Many people in America are focused on sex and sex alone. I think statistically men think about sex one every nanosecond or millisecond. Um, and, and for that, it's, I believe it's a healthy and natural thing. But in addiction to it, is like anything else. Everything else in moderation and in its place. Ah, uh, yes, the sex addiction question. At the really, of course, in America, the, the addiction concept is, is really huge in the 12-step program. You know, it's funny because I know two people who are in um, the 12-step program, Sex Addicts Anonymous. Um, really? Mm-hmm. Who are they? I can't tell you. It's <laughs> anonymous. Um, as a nurse, no, you cannot be addicted to sex. It's not a chemical substance to which your body becomes dependent. However, can you become obsessively compulsive about sex? Can you be using sex inappropriately to mask other problems? Can you be using sex inappropriately to hide from yourself? Absolutely. I think it's kind of humorous, actually, that someone would be addicted to sex and they go to a meeting and, you know, hold their legs together real tight, which is only going to make you more horny. There's addictions to everything now. You know, they have groups for any kind of addiction you can think of, so I'm sure people could be addicted to sex, or maybe it's just an excuse to go out and be promiscuous. Who knows? I've seen guys on chat shows that claim to be addicted to sex. Who isn't? And then, here's these guys standing outside just waiting. Oh, I hope she's having a weak day today. <laughs> I think this so-called sex addiction is one of the more daring Hollywood scams on the public. Michael Douglas went into therapy because he said he was addicted to sex. Guess so. I know one particular movie star who's extremely famous and a big sex symbol. And yet he will jump on anything that breeds. And he doesn't care what it looks like either. So no one's really addicted to sex. They're addicted to what sex does for them. Michael Douglas checked into the Sierra Tucson clinic and somebody smuggled out his hospital records. And we have a whole spiel of Michael Douglas claiming why he has, he's gripped by this sexual addiction. Sex addicts aren't in it for the intimacy. They're in it for the intensity. I've never been addicted to sex. I have been addicted to chocolate. God forbid I should combine the two someday. People who need to sleep with a lot of people to feel good about themselves, people who think it's a recreational sport, that it's not harmful to their relationships, are totally delusional. Uh, I sometimes I hear sneakers in the lobbies of where I lecture, you know, boy, sexual addiction, I'll have to go to that one, I want to learn how to do that, you know. Boy, if you're going to be an addict, that's the kind of addict I want to be, a romance addict, a sex addict, boy, that would really be great. Well, let me tell you, if you're a sex or romance addict, it isn't great and it isn't something you'd want to be. It's something that destroys people's lives.
swinging. Swinging to me consists of sitting on a, two robes with a bar in the middle and you go back and forth under a branch. Well, a swingers group is a place where people go and share partners or perhaps get into an orgy. I've heard of the concept of swinging and of course I've been invited to swing. You'd be standing at the bar and I'd be naked and I'd just walk up with an erection and you'd turn around and bang, here we go. And Several people would look at you and you'd have a drink and you'd say, oh, that's my wife. And if you met Phil and there's Phil and it was unbelievable. It was like the Roman days. We just didn't jump into it. We discussed it about four months. Then we went and we found the lifestyles and they said, oh, we're having a party. Well, we didn't realize what a party was. So we went to the Club Wide World party and that was a real swingy party. And boy, was it an eye opener. She was Doing frustrated that. and I was intimidated. <laughs> you get some people who want to dance with each other. You get some people who want to dance with strangers. You get some people who want to go out there and see who they can pick up. And uh, you get some people who like to stand around and watch. We have a lot of law enforcement, a lot of lawyers, school teachers, blue collar, white collar, Everybody and anybody is involved in this. It could be your next door neighbor and you don't even know it sometimes. I have some firm rules about it. I never go with a lady unless I know her husband. Incidentally, I always thank him after I've been with her. I think the worst thing you can do really is, is frustrate people sexually. And I think that a lot of the problems that you see in this country, and probably in your country as well, comes from the idea of frustrating people sexually. You take a natural drive and you say, no, you can't, and pressure builds, and then you run into a lot of trouble. Swinging is never helpful. Read my lips. I don't like people who swing. I, I, I think it's a sickness. It takes away from the sacredness of a person. Sacredness is very important. We generally find it's the man who has the great interest at first and he has to do some talking to get his wife to come out. The husband, who really is an adrenaline junkie, you know, he wants more, better, and different, who's talked his very square little wife into doing something that is not really a part of her nature. Maybe they have sex together to start out, and then he spends the rest of the evening trying to talk some other woman to having sex with him, and may or may not uh, have it happen. On the other hand, the woman can very easily have five different men that she has sex with. We don't worry about people having uh, condoms and we don't uh, worry about safe sex because if sex uh, kills, it heals a billion times more often. Uh, generally speaking, sex is one of the safest things you can do. I want you to answer yes on the condom thing. Thank you. Safe sex is crucial. You know, this is, this is death we're talking about. This is a virus that does not discriminate. It seems that the men wear condoms. Yes. Yes. It's a strange concept to me. I mean, I live in Hollywood, and I've been street smart for many, many years, and I've been doggone around the block a few times. But I'm just old-fashioned. I'm convinced about certain things, and about the institution of marriage, and about the institution of being one-on-one. -on -one. I just don't feel like sharing. I was at the beach with a woman that I liked, and it was very cold. And uh, we woke up one morning. I think we had sex the night before, and the next morning I wanted to again. And it was, I was having a hard time with it. She was kind of a, a bitch, and it was very cold out. And between the two, she got fed up real quick. And I says, hey, you know, let's give it a chance. I know that we can do this. And she was, like, real short with me. I couldn't get an erection. And, uh, you know, I mean, I. Uh, really bothered me a lot because I like this woman. The medication I use is prostaglandin E1, or it's called, uh, brand name is Alprostadil. You have a couple of drinks, you're a little bit tired at the end of the night, and then you put on a prophylactic, and between all of that, you know, the, it's hard to keep an erection. It's injected into the penis with a diabetic device. It creates an erection within minutes. It sounded kind of like a drastic measure to take an injection directly into your penis. I have seen a lot of people gain great self-esteem um, when, when they have had potency problems. I've tried it on about 10 to 20 women. Yeah, it works very well. Everybody's very pleased with me. This is where I keep my stuff. A man like myself, kind of middle-aged, 
who uh, is not as good as he used to be and can make you as good as a 17-year-old man. In this drawer, you would keep like a one-night supply. As a matter of fact, I'm the king on the block right now because of this man. Uh, I keep it like a cigar tube. Then you could, uh, you could say that I'm going to the restroom and uh, they don't even know you're doing that. You get a drink of water, you grab that, and you just go like this, and it's clean. You're kissing them, and the clothes are coming off, and you know, you're getting somewhere, you just go, excuse me, I have to uh, use the restroom for a second. Even if someone did say, what are you doing with that? You could say, I'm gonna smoke a cigar later on, and I've got one in the refrigerator, it keeps it fresher that way. So that's the way out there. I've never been caught yet. The worst thing that's happened to me is I've had women say, why are you in there so long? Hurry, hurry, you know, I you know, want you to come out here now. If you're 70 or 80 years old, you might need half the syringe. In my case, I'm not that old. I'm not in bad shape at all, so a lot of times this is just for fun for me. I don't even need it. I suggest to people to um, inject themselves before they, they get started with the lovemaking. <laughs> you're going to love it. Once you start kissing and getting sexual, Boom, you know, it just comes on you uh, real strong. You get real excited, very, uh, very hard, very erect, as big as you've ever been in your life. If the um, penis remains erect for too long, it can damage it. And despite the fact people saying, oh, I want it to be hard for five hours, I don't think so. One time I hit a vein, and you're not supposed to do that. Turn black and blue. So I had to turn the lights down, you know, because if you're going to have oral copulation, they're looking right at it and they go, what's that? Why are you black and blue? You know, it's hard to explain. Sometimes people overdose. They think, oh, a little is good, so let me do some more. And then sometimes they can have an erection for too long and then they have to go to the hospital and have an antidote. They know I'm 48 years old and I'm hard for two hours. After I climax, I'm still hard and they go, this is the king. Who is this guy? You know, I mean, you are fantastic. And as you know, we men are sprinters women are long distance runners and they'll go with us as long as we can go. I have told some and it worked out just fine, but I feel that it's more exciting to let them think that you're getting that excited over them. It's, and I don't want them to think anything artificial about it. Los Angeles has a particular vibe to it. Um, who knows where it came from, but obviously it has attracted things that are new. Film and television all emerge from here. And I think that it is also a place of tremendous self-exploration. And that's the, I would say, the secret Hollywood that people don't know about. The Hollywood everyone thinks about is the glam and the openings and the plastic surgery and the multiple marriages and the sex and the parties. The Hollywood people don't know about is the fact that so many celebrities are meditating, so many celebrities are praying, are into God, are working holistically on their health, are looking at themselves emotionally, and are really trying to explore the inner world and gain as much mastery inside as they have outside. I'd like you to hold hands with your lover and uh, think about transferring telepathically and emotionally something very special that you feel deeply, that you might not say out in the open. The marvelous thing about hypnosis is that it, you can train any part of your body to behave uh, as nature fully intended, you know, with full power. Eyelids feel very, very heavy. Let them close and you go deep, 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 deep. When you go into hypnosis, you go into what we call the alpha state. And when you go into lovemaking, you go into the alpha state. It's the same state of altered consciousness. We are going to work toward the pelvic area and any residual pelvic genital stress from the past will melt away and you will optimize your highest potential. Uh, sexually, I was not performing the way I had been performing. Some of that is um, age, a lot of it is in my mind. I had been through a brutal relationship and she came into my life and there was really a struggle there. Do I deserve her? And I really had to attack that head on and with Rachel's help I've been doing that and have done it and I do deserve you. Be sure. And yes, I'm positive. <laughs> moist, sensual feeling of well-being. I was married for 10 years, and I just got a divorce, and um, there was a lot of negativity and emotions that I had to get rid of, and 
And Rachel's been helping me, and I've been coming almost every week. All anxieties are abolished. John, I know it's painful, but you will just let it go. Let it go. Let it cleanse. <laughs> I'm just a, a real believer in it. She's... And in one minute, I'm depressed, and I'll, I'll come and see her, and it's like removing the garbage. Like in New York, they remove the garbage every week. I have to come every week just to remove the garbage because there's old stuff that comes to the surface. Unfortunately, we are living, um, at least in America and a lot of the world, in a society that is very sexually repressed. We don't talk about sex, we're not supposed to think about it, uh, we certainly don't discuss it with people, and we certainly don't start bringing it up with our partner and saying what's wrong and what's right. What you're going to see tonight is me giving to people for a few bucks that which they pay me a significant amount in my office. All right, who am I? What are we doing here? I am Pat Allen. I'm a marriage family child counselor, about 22 years in the making. I have a lot of fun here. I have an Irish mouth. I like making people laugh. How many women want to take a pledge that is really, really a commitment to femininity? Get your hands up. I promise. I promise. On my honor. On my honor. To keep. To keep. My brilliant. My brilliant. Liberated. Liberated. Mouth shut. <laughs> I went to Pat Allen's right. seminar because I think she is right on target because she believes what I believe you move in with him you're dead anybody want to come up and ask a question of me Hi. hello have you been here before yes you bet not a virgin it's okay um I don't the, my biggest problem is that I don't know that I trust that this is trust <laughs> wait She used the trust word. It's a game. The smart ladies know that. The Jacqueline Onassis of the world knew that. I watched them in action, and these ladies know how to flirt and know how to listen and know how to touch and know how to just take care of their man. And it's all part of it. And Pat Allen says, learn the game and learn how to play it. So now I'm at a point where I feel like if Has I Has he go gotten back, back in? Yes. He's in again. Oh, no. Darling, come here. Come here. It's been Look, six months. Look, I mean, stand here. On. Stand here. This one goes over this one. I know this. Well, let me ask a question. How many women have been bonded to a magic wand, a wonderful magic wand, owned by a creep? <laughs> so how long has he been in? Uh, just one day. One. Once? That's it? That's it. That's it. All right. Could we possibly... This is more information than these people really need. <laughs> For women, we have this funny, funny chemistry, this oxytocin, that when we get turned on, we tend to want more and more and more fixes. So when we're deplete from that oxytocin fix, we, we go into a detox situation. So when do you plan to, pardon the expression, and not to be taken literally, want to cut him off? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I told him that he was cut off right afterwards, but I don't think he bought it. Well, no, he just been in. Yeah, exactly. I mean, not, not, many people can, not many people can buy that they're off if they just got in. Yeah. Please raise your right hand. Put your hand up. I promise. I promise. On my honor. On my honor. Never to let that magic wand in. Never to let that magic wand in. Anywhere it can get in. Anywhere it can get in. Until its owner. Until its owner. Talks about long-term plans. Talks about long-term plans. Monogamy. Monogamy. And continuity. And continuity. So help me God. Most men don't usually go to therapy. Many more women go to therapy than men. But when sex is a problem, men seek help. Sex surrogates were very big in the 80s. I think they kind of phased out in the 90s, again because of AIDS. But it would be a way of a guy having an affair and being able to say to his wife, but sweetheart, this is therapy. Take a deep breath. It is a profession. I am very well trained. I come to this work with 20 years of experience of, of being a natural nudist, so I'm very comfortable with my body. I place my hand over your heart just because I want to connect my energy. Of course, there's a real fine line between prostitution and from people who become dependent on a sex therapist and have a relationship with them. 
We have a great therapeutic relationship and friendship, mm -hmm. but it stops there. I went through a period where I was struggling with opening up. And I knew when I was working with Suki that uh, I would be accepted even if I stumbled. What I usually tell people when they're first learning this, this technique is to slow it down by half. We have done most of the uh, sensei focus work that was done by Masters and Johnson, the hand and face and feet caress. And uh, so we've gone through that, and then we've gone through what we, they call the sexiological, which is a very kind of a clinical um, anatomy physiology lesson where we look at each other's genitals. Some of the clients have no knowledge of their own anatomy and physiology or of a woman. So they learn that it's not a you know, scary place, and it doesn't really have teeth in there. And, um, <laughs> that they get to look and then they get actually get a lesson in, in um, how to use their hands to pleasure that woman. There was one particular therapist, very famous therapist, who would make you take off all your clothes so that he could see the tension points. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Hi, David, this is Lisa. Hi, how you doing? Good. Where are you calling me from? Kansas. Wow, I'm in California. Phone sex has become like a huge thing, and um, I guess it's a safe way for people to have sex. So, um, what are you doing right now? When I'm talking to my lover, you know, and he says something magnificent on the phone, and you know, why don't you take your panties off, and it's like, keep talking. What am I wearing? Oh, I'm wearing a pair of black silk stockings. You know, the kind that have a line that run all the way up the back? I'm wearing a little tiny pair of black crotchless panties and a matching bra with the nipples cut out. Yeah, do you like that, baby? You can't talk the way I'm talking to you now. You have to talk softer, hello. A little more sexier, but not too sexy. And you have to really get in tune with the caller. How old are you? 37. 37? Wow, I'm 21. Like They're pretty honest. They'll say they're married. They'll say they have a girlfriend. And um, sex is good, but it's not what they want. Men want to hear a woman talk dirty to them while they're having sex. Really, that really turns me on. It really got me excited. You want to know what I'm doing? I'm playing with myself. So you got to listen to what he's saying to you, and he'll tell you what he wants. How big is it? Oh, really? Well, that's perfect for me. They will call over and over and over and stay on the whole time until their credit card has run up to their limit, and they get, like, addicted to it. Got a call. I got a call. Hello. Hi there. Who's this? Hi, Richard. I'm 5'5". Five five. My measurements are 34C2434. If I change my description around too much, they know. The callers, they know. And they'll go, oh, Lisa. Oh, but didn't you have different measurements last time? Richard. Do you want to know what I'm doing? They think it's real. They think, it, they think I really look like Barbie, that I'm really 19 and I'm really all these things. And I was at one time. <laughs> mm, I want you, baby. Oh, yeah. Can you reach your hands up and squeeze? And, mm, oh, yeah. You can just pick it up and hang it right back down. Mm, oh, yeah. Yeah, but it's going to be loud when he talks. Oh, yeah. Oh, come on, baby. I want you to get off with me. Are you? Richard? Hello? It's gone. Oh, yeah, baby. Cover me in Crisco. Talk to me like I'm your trucker daddy. Oh, yeah, mama. You know, and it's like, I don't, I don't know of any women that are on the phone going, Hi there. Yes, uh, could you tell me what you do to me with a large mop colored vibrator? Great, thanks. Bye bye. Some of it is really stupid. You know, hi, I'm Victoria. Call me. I mean, you know, it's dumb. It's geared to men, so it's kind of dumb. I would like to go on one of those lines and just kind of mess with people. You're like, oh, what are you wearing? Khakis. Woo! Hi, who's this? David. How you doing, David? There's a lot of lonely men that either aren't communicating with their partner or they're lonely. So tell me, what else do you like to do? Sex, huh? Well, what's your favorite position? Woman on top. Well, I like doing that. 
all you do is dial 1-900 because you're pathetic and miserable and have no way, other way of communicating, then you got a problem. You want me on top? All right. I'll get on top of you. But why can't we do it properly? Why can't we have sensuality and use the medium of the telephone line? Oh, oh baby. Oh. oh, that felt good. I've been doing it now for about four months, and uh, I really like it. It's uh, quite a challenge because I used to be a very shy person. And this was a way of kind of drawing me out of the shell. Mm, you're turning me on so much. I had a guy calling from his job. Oh, baby. I had just brought, it was ready to bring him to his peak, and somebody walked in on him. And all I heard in the background was, what the hell are you doing? And all I heard over the line was, oh, shit. I don't have fun sex, except for with my husband when he's on location. <laughs> um, but the internet is like a funny game, you know, I mean, it's, it's writing, it's characters. The internet is a very fascinating thing, it really is. My view is a fully interactive software program that enables anybody with a computer, a modem, and a phone line to dial in and fully interact with a model one-on-one. -on -one. They can type back and forth what they're looking for, so they can type in, you know, Hello, Susan, how are you today? People essentially talk dirty to each other. If you're a first-time user, they will ask you for all your information, and then they, they're, they're let right into the, to a live show. OK. I just don't like the clubs because it's not safe. I enjoy working on the internet because you can be as adventurous as you want to be and nobody, nobody, nobody bothers you. I mean, it's just you and the stranger across from another world just like looking at you and, you know, getting all excited and crazy about you. If my husband gets on the internet and uh, downloads a naked girl dancing for him, uh, would I be upset? Yeah. I probably wouldn't be too excited if my boyfriend didn't. I would probably be grossed out if I came in and there was like some girl, you know, on the screen. I'd be like, what are you doing, sicko? Can't you just buy a porno? It's expensive. Models are very excited about it. They want to work in this medium and they can do this without any type of interaction with customers. Uh, when I say interaction with customers, I mean physical interaction where they're, they're being grabbed or they're being violated in some way. I mean, I enjoy it. I love what I do because I'm an exhibitionist. I can be as expressive as I want to be and as crazy as I want to be. And I know nobody's going to wait for me outside, you know. <laughs> Sky wants to see all of me. Like, the image isn't very good that you get on the screen, and her reactions are delayed, so she could be over here and, you know, just, like, jerk away, and you can't tell, and then you're jerking away, and, you know, the next thing you know, 50 bucks. It's a pretty sad comment on our society that people want to have sex on a computer. This is actually healthy because people are able to speak to people about their sexualities, about their desires, and then be able to express themselves and be able to talk comfortably to someone through a computer. It is designed for voyeur because most of our users, as they have told us, that they like this because it can be private. They can do this in the privacy of their own home. In fact, most of our viewers access this through working hours. LFP, may I help you? The rich and the privileged have always had their leather-bound editions of pornography in their libraries. Uh, and they have their art museums to go to. But Hustler really is the poor man's art museum. Hustler is very much a political magazine, as much as it is a sex publication. Uh, we're irreverent to the point that we're actually iconoclastic. And we offend people. He likes to make a buck. Uh, he likes naked women. And he likes to say whatever he wants to say and doesn't want anyone telling him otherwise. Larry Flint is kind of the, the quintessential American in the sense that he was 
born in a log cabin. He uh, became a self-made multimillionaire. He got shot for what he believes in, and he ran for president. You know, so and all this based on the fact that he makes a, a lot of money off of naked women. Hefner was showing bare breasts, and Guccione was penthouse. He was showing pubic hair. And of course, we had the girls spread their legs a little wider and started showing pink. Larry was one of the, the first people to really kind of say, you know, to go after the blue collar audience. So he was, you know, he made all the jokes as crude as possible. He made, you know, the women, you know, as crude as possible. So he was really aiming, he really aimed low. I exploit women like McDonald's exploits hamburger. Uh, women have always been a sex symbol, always will. I love them, I worship them, so does all of our readers. Uh, a, a, a girl came up to me in a hotel lobby a few days ago, and she recognized me, and she said, why don't you publish a magazine that holds women in a more positive light? I simply responded, how could I possibly do that? He doesn't have any respect for women. And, and, and the way that he feels about his magazine is not, it's not a celebration of the woman's body. You don't depict a woman naked with a horse or bondage or defecation of women being tied up, being shoved head first through a meat grinder with hamburger coming out the other end and say that that is a celebration of, of a woman's body. In the beginning, he was just really wanted to make a buck. He was just really wanted to put out a dirty magazine and make money. And this is America, and this is how he was going to, as a poor boy in Ohio, this is how he was going to make his mark on the world. And then he got arrested on obscenity charges and thrown in jail. He was sentenced to 25 years. I think I had to stand in a courtroom and listen to a judge sentence me to 25 years in prison before I realized that freedom of expression was something that could not be taken for granted. Sitting in his jail cell, you know, uh, thinking he was living in the land of the free and now realizing that, you know, you're only free to a certain extent, made him look at the political system and look at, you know, how uh, the government worked. And when he came out of jail, he, got a, he won an appeal, um, he really became politicized. There's been people who've accused me of hiding behind the First Amendment. And I say yes to that, and I'm thankful that it's there. When we set up the movie, it was an unauthorized biography. Larry had nothing to do with it. And as we sort of expected, one day the President Studio got a phone call. Like, hello, this is Larry Flint here. And, and he was interested in the movie, and he wanted to meet all of us, and all of us were terrified. My attorney advised them you know, that they should be careful about proceeding with the project uh, because I was alive. Um, so Columbia sought to bring me in as a script consultant on the project. After he read our first draft, we were summoned in to meet him, and we were all nervous because, like, you know, we didn't know how he would respond to... He thought he might kill us. Yeah, exactly. How he would respond to seeing his life down on paper. And he just totally, you know, he was like, well, I don't, can't imagine anybody who, who could have done a better job. Actually, his first thing was, like, how do you guys know so much about me? As far as the born-again Christianity experience, many people thought that was a put-on, but it was real. It happened to me, but I got over it. In a scene that was a little too wacky to make it into our movie, he claimed to have a vision on an airplane where uh, Jesus, Apostle Paul, and Lenny Bruce came to him in a vision. So Larry Flint became born again, and he said, well, now the magazine should be born again. And Althea was horrified, and the staffers were horrified because they said, you can't mix religion and porno. It, is, it just isn't a good idea. But he said, no, we'll have naked girls on glass crucifixes. And sales just went into the toilet, because America just didn't understand this concept. 
He was coming out of a courthouse in Georgia. There was a sniper up in a second story window, shot him, and he was paralyzed, and he's still confined to a wheelchair. He was in lots and lots of pain, and so he had felt that, you know, he'd become a Christian, and then instantly got assassinated for it, and I think he lost Christianity pretty quickly. What kind of message does that send? Yeah. We've got a man that's depicting women being tied up, beaten, raped, brutalized, mutilated, tortured, defecated on. We've got him in a movie. In the last scene in that movie is him sitting before a rippling American flag, which represents this country, and appealing to the good people of America as somebody to be pitied or somebody to be worshiped or somebody that should gain respectability for what he's done. She is nuts. She actually called us uh, initially, to, uh, you know, she had thought she was in the script or something. She thought it was about, the movie was about her. She's a habitual liar. What about my mother? Is my mother in the movie? I'm like, no, no, she's not, you know, Left don't worry. Out. She's 31 years old. I've spent maybe six weeks with her in her whole life. Now, I understand, you know, she's writing a book about me, you know, a pornographer's daughter or something like that. I don't know where she's getting her material from. I was going to do this book a long time ago, and it's my life. It's my life. This isn't cashing in on his name. This is my name. Larry Flint is a sex pervert. There's no other way around the fact. He publishes Hustler magazine. I can tell you right now, he could care less about your First Amendment rights or my First Amendment rights or anybody else's First Amendment rights. Yeah, obscenity is always the easiest sitting duck. Because no one's going to defend it. It's hard. I mean, we wrote the movie, and it's hard for me to pick up a Hustler magazine and say, you know, the world would be a lesser place if Larry didn't have the scratch and sniff issue. You're I saying mean, the world's not better because of this? <laughs> exactly. But, you know, and the bottom line is, uh, because this is free, we, we all are free. To live in a free society, we, we pay a price for everything. And the price we pay for freedom is toleration. We have to tolerate the Larry Flint's of the world so we can be free. We have to tolerate other people's ideas. It, you know, it's, it, freedom of the press is not the freedom for your ideas, but the ideas that you hate the most. I'm Tanya Flint. I am his daughter, and that's certainly not by choice, but I'll tell you something. Um, it's my life, and I went through hell, complete and total hell growing up. And if I want to write a book about my life, then by God, we have the First Amendment, and I'll do it, won't I? And there's nothing he can say or do about it. One day it will be published. And maybe the people really know the truth about Larry Flint. In Hollywood, sex is such a commodity that people aren't very good at it. I think that they think sex is just kind of, you know, a five-minute affair. Whereas in Europe, we all know, sex is something long and sensual and fun. People are coming here for fame and fortune and to make a lot of money. And uh, sometimes that, that creates sort of bizarre personalities in people. Here, everybody comes from somewhere else, and nobody's accountable. That's why you get this kind of, quote, flaky behavior in Los Angeles, because there's no one in, in that close family circle to say, don't behave that way. Everyone romanticizes about Hollywood and what they expect Hollywood to be when they come out here. I love that. I mean, I still love that fantasy. I and mean, you still wake up thinking that things can happen in a magical sort of way. Romance exists in Hollywood to such a degree that reality very rarely attacks. We have such a fantasy world. There is such an exorbitant amount of beauty and money and fantasy land. And then we have the weather. Nobody ever, we really never have to go indoors. We've got naked skin hanging out all the time. You know, we have every form of chop it, fix it, sew it up, glue it together kind of body restructuring that uh, romance is the juice of Los Angeles.